Thumbs up? All right. Well, if it was anyone here yesterday to hear my talk. <laughs> so there was a uh, scheduling situation. I was always supposed to be here today, not yesterday, um, but they made a little uh, scheduling snafu. So I apologize if you were here yesterday waiting patiently while I was still sitting in my office in San Francisco. So um, anyway, uh, you guys having fun? Aquashella? All right. How many of you, this is your first time coming to an aquarium event? All right, fair amount, nice. So uh, these are great. It's always fun to meet people, to meet you know fellow hobbyists, people that consume content. It's always weird when someone comes up and introduces themselves to me and I'm like, yeah, hi, I'm Zunzo. They're like, yeah, I know, I met you already, or I saw you on YouTube kind of a thing. So um, anyway, for those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Zenzo Tazawa and I have a YouTube channel called Tazawa Tanks, and I also work for Aquarium Co-op, which some of you may be familiar with, a larger company. I'm the uh, Director of Marketing and Customer Engagement uh, for Aquarium Co-op. So today, I want to talk to you about how to earn money in the aquarium hobby. People like money? Who likes money? Who doesn't like money? <laughs> All right, that's a better question. Now, throughout the, uh, throughout, I'm going to go kind of quickly because of the time thing, but, um, and I'll try to talk over any loudness in the back there. But if you guys have questions throughout the, uh, the presentation, just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll uh, try to listen or you can run up and ask me a question. So why do we want to earn money? It's pretty self-explanatory, but some people, you know, might want to know why you want to earn money in the aquarium hobby. Here you can see this is my fish room. Uh, San Francisco is not notorious for not having a lot of space, but I'm lucky to have a, a large basement that uh, is finished. So we built a fish room down there. Um, but more money, more tanks, right? You guys are here. You're at an aquarium convention. There's lots of cool stuff. You're like, oh, I want an oxalotl tank or, oh, I should make some cichlids or something like that. It costs money. So if you can make money, you can get more tanks. Energy bills, water bills, this really does help. So like at my house, our energy bill just for electricity and gas in the colder months is like $600 a month. In the summer months, it's still like close to $400. So it's not cheap. And I know a lot of it's my fault. So my wife gets mad at me and I can say, well, we're making money through the stuff that I'm doing. And so it's helping to pay for the bills, right? Or if you're a kid and you want more tanks and you can tell you know, mom or dad, hey, I'm breeding something and I'm making money. Uh, secondary source of income, it's great. It's always nice to have another source of income to pay for stuff, to buy more tanks. Maybe you've got a kid going to college or you wanna buy a new car. It's nice to have an extra four or $500 per month to go towards that. And there's also the opportunity for it to be a primary source of income. So looking around the show here, there's a lot of vendors. For a lot of them, the aquatic industry, aquariums, is their primary source of income. It's their business. And so there are a lot of opportunities. I know some people here work in the aquarium industry. We've got uh, Serena here who works for Aquarium Co-op. <clears throat> All right. So real quickly, a little bit about my background. Um, Pause. We are having a world famous Frag off if you're in the coral. Free frags. Okay. So, anyway, real quickly, a little bit about my background. I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, this is the public aquarium. Uh, it's been remodeled uh, since then. And there's a picture of me, little Zenzo, and I don't want to say exactly how old I am, but this is 1970-something. So a uh, long time ago. And I fell in love with aquariums at a very young age. I'd go to the to public aquarium and see these amazing exhibits. And even like the really big, like fancy ones, I wasn't as interested as I was in like the smaller, kind of dingy, bios, you know, kind of the like 
more natural looking aquariums. And so um, anyway, I fell in love with tanks at an early age. And then over the years, I learned how to turn my passion for aquariums into profit. So I thought since I've done a lot of things in the aquarium industry with some businesses that I've had, et cetera, it would be good to share some of this with you. So um, in the early years, when I first kind of got serious into aquariums, it was probably the year 2000, 2001 is probably my, my first daughter was not yet born, about to be born. And I'm like, I'm going to buy this aquarium and I'm going to buy another aquarium. And I started like collecting tanks and you know, like, you guys know what that's like. Um, so I got into breeding and at that time it was basically like, oh, I can make fish. And so my fish would spawn. Obviously I take those fry, grow them out, take them to the store, trade them in for, you know, magazines and fish food and all that kind of stuff. There was no uh, YouTube back then. Uh, and then later on, as I kind of got more into uh, breeding, I would start to sell to stores. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about selling fish and breeding. Um, I also had an aquarium service business. So uh, I had a, before I joined Aquarium Co-op, I had a, uh, I was a director for a large publicly traded company, um, but I needed a second source of income, kids in private school, all that kind of stuff. Living in San Francisco, was, San Francisco was extremely expensive. So looking for some additional revenue streams. So I started an aquarium service business. And uh, so that's another way that I earn money. And then obviously content creation, YouTube, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then also uh, that kind of uh, transitioned into being sponsored by companies, being a brand ambassador. And then eventually that resulted in full-time employment. So who here breeds fish for fun? All right. Who here breeds fish to make money? All right. So what I will tell you is breeding fish for fun is great. I love it. It's probably my favorite thing when I get a fish that I've never kept before and I look in a tank three months later and there's more fish. To me, that's just amazing. I really enjoy it. But if you're going to do it for profit, you really need to think it through. And what you want to do is you want to choose wisely. And this is the mo if you're going to breed for profit, it can be a lot of fun. They really want to push that frag off contest. All right. All right. All right. Moving on. So anyway, you want to choose wisely. It's really important. Uh, you want to see if you're, if you're going to breed for profit, find what's popular in your area. I've got pictures of fish that I bred, shell dwellers, uh, live bears, African cichlids. This African cichlid is a beautiful OB, but where I live, no one keeps African cichlids. So when I was breeding African cichlids, I was selling them to stores. It really didn't make sense. I should have done my research ahead of time, which I didn't do. And there are other fish that I could breed or do breed that are more profitable, like the shell dweller. So as an example, this beautiful peacock, for me to grow that and sell it to a store, I would get wholesale price, $3, $3.50, whatever the wholesale price is for that fish. I can sell these shell dwellers all day long at $10 to $12 a piece. And I don't have to do anything. Just throw them in a 10 gallon tank, scoop a net in there and make a bunch of money. So it's a lot of yeah, understanding what's 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 good in your area. Also, how fast do fish grow? What's the yield going to be? If you're breeding for profit, remember, you're, if this is like something, I'm set up some tanks, I want to make money breeding fish, how, how quickly can you sell them, right? So you have to think about money. If it So again, that peacock, if it takes me five months to grow a fish to sell to a store, that's a lot of time of feeding and taking care of that fish. Who's going to buy them? Kind of same thing. You know, what's popular in the area? How are you going to sell it? How are you going to get the word out there? So a lot of these things you want to know ahead of time, right? If you say, I'm going to breed angelfish, you better find a buyer before you start breeding them or you're going to have a thousand angelfish in like 16 tanks in your, in your garage or something, right? So that will happen. I see it all the time. Uh, you got to figure out if you're going to sell locally or if you're going to ship fish, which we'll talk about. Shipping fish is... Very difficult, 
Sometimes uh, it can be disastrous, it could work well, um, but it's a lot of work and it's expensive shipping, especially in today's uh, shipping environment. Um, selling locally is a lot easier, but then you're restricted to uh, the fish that are popular where you live. Um, and then can you pair the fish that you're breeding with other things? So can you put shrimp in your aquarium to maybe do like guppies or some live bears and shrimp? Will they, you know, cohabitate? And then you have two different things that you can sell. Uh, can you sell plants? So if you're in a planted aquariums and if you can propagate plants, you can sell those along with your fish or two stores or two fish clubs and dry goods. So people don't always realize that, you know, if you're selling a fish, think about what else can you sell that maybe you have access to. So maybe you live in an area where you can get certain botanicals like, like leaves or any kind of botanical that you can, you know, harvest in the forest. And if you say, hey, like I'll sell you this, you know, these 10 shrimp and I also have these, these leaves that I've collected, um, then you can also include an additional revenue stream there. All right, so things to consider when breeding is energy and water. So we talked about, you know, energy cost, water cost, going back to that African cichlid in that last slide. If it takes me five months to sell a fish, that's five months of water, five months of energy, it's five months of food, it's five months of chemicals and medications or whatever I'm using, dechlorinators, salts, buffers, etc. equipment. So these are all the things that you want to consider if you are going to breed for profit. It can be done, but just remember that you're going up against fish farms. Maybe there are farms in Florida that can just do stuff outside. They can, you know, get a backhoe and, you know, dig big vats and line them. And they can rely on the, you know, the, the, the warm waters uh, or the warm air in Florida and, and uh, not have to... Uh, deal with keeping, you know, a bunch of tanks in a garage kind of a thing. You're dealing, you're competing against breeders in Asia that can do things by the thousands. So, you know, think about this as you are looking into breeding fish because there might be a niche for you, but you want to make sure that you do your research ahead of time. I've seen so many people get into breeding and the next thing you know, they're just collecting tanks and collecting fish because they can't move them. And then time, obviously time is very finite. So, how much time do you want to spend breeding fish? It, it, if it's a little bit of time and it's just kind of something supplemental, that's great. If it's uh, occupying a ton of your time, you may want to reconsider. <clears throat> so I've kind of said the bad things, like it's expensive, you're going to hard to sell fish, all these things, right? Is it worth it? Heck yeah, it's worth it. So. This right here is, uh, do you guys know who Wild Fish Tanks is? Yep, uh, um, Ryan Kinney. So this is his garage. And I think he has 87 tanks in this garage. There might be some more now, but he's, he's got 87. At the time that I saw this, it was 87. And I reached out to him and talked to him. Uh, and he, he sent me all this information. Um, so he said, treat it like a real business for best results. So if you are going to get into breeding for profit, you have got to approach it as a business and do your research and all, all the homework that I kind of mentioned earlier. Don't have huge expectations. Enjoy the process. So if you, again, you love this hobby, you're, you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't love aquariums. Like you're not going to go to a fish convention with a bunch of fish nerds, sit and listen to some guy talk about fish if you aren't super into it, right? So enjoy it. If you're breeding fish and it's a hassle, stop. Like if you're not having fun, don't do it. So here, Ryan, he says, um, this, this is his current info. Uh, he's doing a hundred plus orders of fish every month with 120 to 150 box shipped. I don't know what he's charging for fish, but I can tell you that he is making decent money. Uh, in addition, he's going to three fish clubs a month in his local area. He lives in Florida. And so in Florida, there's a lot of fish clubs and selling locally at fish clubs is a great way to sell fish. I've done that. Um, if there's fish clubs in your area, I would highly recommend it. So it's quite profitable. It can be if you approach it the right way. So all those other things that I said, I just want you to think about those things, what to consider before getting into breeding fish, because it's, it's not always as easy as people think, but it can be great if you do it right. 
Uh, there is a Breeding for Profit series on the Aquarium Co-op YouTube channel. Um, it's several hours of uh, Corey talking about uh, different ways of, of uh, breeding fish and he kind of gets into more detail. <clears throat> okay, aquarium service. So obviously that's not me. I'm not swimming inside an aquarium, but uh, it is easy money. So of all the different ways of making money, I believe that servicing aquariums is the easiest way to make money the hard way because you're gonna get wet, you're gonna get stinky, you're gonna get fish poop on your arms, you're gonna get algae on your shirt, you're gonna be, you know, all those things, but you are gonna make, a, you, their potential for making money is there. So one of the great things about service is it's low overhead, right? You don't have a store to maintain, you don't have a bunch of equipment or anything like that, there's no inventory. It's basically you, your pumps and scrapers and nets and dechlorinators and just your labor. So it's mostly profit. Um, it is hard work, but it is high pay. Now the pay is really dependent upon what service you're providing, what area you live in. But remember one thing, customers are paying you for your time, but they're paying you for your experience. So it's if, 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 if a business or a, uh, a person, you know, wants their aquarium serviced, they're not just going to any person saying, hey, can I pay 25 bucks an hour to take care of this aquarium? They're paying you for your years of experience with fish husbandry, water chemistry, learning all the different, you know, YouTube videos on live streams that you listen to, magazines that you read, going to talks like this, talking to vendors, being immersed in the hobby. That's the experience that you have that just any regular person off the street doesn't have right so they're paying you for the experience the same thing as like me like if like uh i'm pretty handy on working on cars and trucks and motorcycles that i have my whole life and i've done you know regular kind of jobs on cars and stuff but there are some jobs where i'm like that's going to take me 10 hours i'm going to have like five you know cuts on my finger i'm going to be yelling my wife's going to be wondering why i'm so angry I'm gonna be filthy or I can take it to a professional, have it done in two hours, pay them to do it, and it's, and it's good. I'm paying them for their experience. Uh, the types of jobs when you're doing uh, aquarium service, obviously water changes and maintenance, uh, tank builds, tank setups, uh, consultation. So that was something that I did a lot. People just wanna know like, you know, they have a problem with an aquarium or they um, wanna set up a certain type of setup and they're not quite sure what to do. I would go and they would pay me for my time and my experience and I would sit with them and talk about what to do or I would uh, look at their system and set up and give them recommendations on what may not work, what to change, that kind of a thing. Moving, uh, that's a big one. Moving is a traumatic experience for, for most people anyway, right? Just moving sucks, whether you're moving out of your apartment or a house or whatever it is. Moving fish tanks is incredibly stressful if, has anyone here had to move with fish tanks? Okay, how did, was, was it great? Was it fun? No, it's, it's it, yeah, <laughs> it can be fun. Maybe you had a bunch of buddies out, but usually it's not fun. Um, so that's something that you could offer in an aquarium service. So like anything, like any business, you wanna do your research ahead of time. Here's a map of San Francisco. In this area, it's pretty much where I tried to limit where I would drive. I didn't want to cross bridges if I didn't have to and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're, it's a very densely populated area, so um, I had that luxury. Uh, but you want to do your market research? Is there a need in your area? If you live in a small town and there's already three companies doing it, maybe not. Maybe you do something different. But if there's not, or if you, if you know that like, yeah, there's people out there doing it, but I hear people asking all the time about service companies, then uh, that might be a good opportunity. So find out if there's a need in your area. Um, and that's what I did. I actually, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I would like listen in at stores. I'd be like at a Petco or a PetSmart buying dog food or something. And then I'd walk over to this section because I needed some blood worms. And I would hear someone talking to an employee there who probably knows more about you know parakeets and kitty cats than they do about fish that uh, they were getting some bad advice or they were looking for something and I would listen in as, and I would do this all the time. And I, I realized there's a, a need for more people in this area to give consultations and help people. 
um, advertising, website, uh, sites like Craigslist. I know this was a long time ago. There's other sites now. Uh, store referrals. So um, going back to building rapport with local fish stores, that would be my number one thing that I would recommend if you are going to have a service business is talk to your local fish stores. First off, you want to find out, are they doing it right? Because it might be where they have their own service business and they don't want you encroaching on it. Or maybe they do and they're like, yeah, I can't handle all the customers every week. Someone new comes in and I can't, I've got to turn them away. So if you build that relationship with the stores, they will be very helpful in helping to feed your service business. Um, I always carried business cards on hand. So again, I'm in that Petco buying dog food. I walk over to the fish section. I hear someone, I reach into my pocket, hand them a business card. And maybe I have a client or maybe not, but I'm always, you know, always thinking about how to market myself. Um, setting pricing. Setting pricing is very difficult if you are going to have a service business because there's not a lot of things to refer to in your area. It's not like where you can, if, if you're a, a mechanic and you know that, um, you know, the normal you know rate for replacing an alternator is $400 or whatever, you can see, you can call 15 shops and they'll tell you what their rate is. But with aquariums, it's a little bit different, right? It's a little bit difficult. So know your worth, know your market. Um, you know, San Francisco, again, it's expensive. So I was able to charge a higher amount. Uh, other areas where it's a different uh, economy, I'd have to charge less. So just kind of think about your market. Um, but also remember that you have experience. So you can't charge just for your labor. You don't want to just charge that $25 an hour because it's that experience that you have that other people don't have. So you got to think of yourself more like an expert, like that mechanic or a dentist or someone that's charging more because they are a specialized uh, field. So what do you need to get started? We're going to get to this picture here in a second, these pictures. It's a funny story. So um, it's easy, right? Business license and permits, you're going to need that, but they're super cheap. Uh, anyone here have a business license for where they live? Pretty inexpensive. Yeah, this is, I, 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 maybe a couple hundred bucks a year, depending on where you live at the most. So it's really easy to get a business license or a permit. Um, advertising is super easy. I used to do it for free in a lot of areas. Um, insurance. You're, you are going to want to have insurance. I keep looking at my watch just to make sure I'm speeding up a little bit. You are going to want to have insurance, but insurance is not that expensive. It's a very inexpensive thing to protect yourself. If you own a house, have insurance. If you own anything, have insurance. I carried a million dollar policy because I serviced businesses and like healthcare centers and things like that. They would require me to carry uh, a million dollar policy. Transportation. You don't need to buy a van. You don't need to, to, to buy a specialized truck. Mini Cooper. So um, I like cars and behind this, this car through the window, that's a, one of my cars there. But I had this mini as like my little city car to zip around town and park anywhere. And I also used it for service because I could park anywhere. And inside this mini, I have a 60 gallon aquarium. It's a four foot long tank. It's like a 55, but taller. I've got a chiller. I've got a canister filter in there. I got buckets of fish. I've got a suitcase with all my gear. I've got towels in there. Now I barely could fit, obviously. It was just the driver's seat that was left open. But you don't need a lot to get started. You can, you can have a service business with whatever vehicle you have now. If you have a car, a truck, whatever, an SUV, it will work just fine. Equipment, you know, uh, I would recommend having a separate set of equipment from what you have at home. So, you know, pumps for moving water, nets, algae scrapers, all that kind of stuff. But that's very inexpensive. You could be all in and have everything you need for probably 200 bucks. And then you can go out and charge you know, hundred dollars to clean someone's 75 gallon, 75 gallon fish tank. Do that a couple times and you've paid for all your equipment. Uh, chemicals, disposals, the chlorinator, it's super inexpensive, right? You get a, a bottle of, uh, you know, prime or, or, uh, Fritz complete or something like that. And, uh, it lasts a long time. And then add-ons, you could have add-ons with you. So like if you service certain types of filters, you can have cartridges, you know, in your suitcase that you can sell to your customer, bags of purigen, stuff like that. Have some add-ons to be able to, to add on to the sale, essentially. So again, I told you all the hard parts, you're gonna get dirty, it's a lot of work, you gotta do your research. 
but hard work does pay off. So this is my friend, Phil. He has a service business in San Francisco. In fact, he took some of my customers when I shut my business down. And every time I text him, every time I call him, he's working. Oh, I just got back from this pond. I got to go do this tank. But he is making a lot of money. <clears throat> so he gets, sets his own schedule. He's his own boss. He works when he wants to work. He doesn't work when he doesn't want to work. So that's great. Um, he's got about 30 regular customers that he sees once or twice per month. And the average account has two aquariums. Some have one, some have five. So it averages out to be about two. And then he's got other infrequent customers that might be like once every three months to do the pond or the canister filter or whatever it might be. Um, other odd jobs, moving, one-off consultations, that kind of thing. But he's making six figures and all he does is clean fish tanks. He used to work at a fish store. He now works four hours a week at a fish store just to help them unbox. And the rest of the time he's servicing aquariums and he's making over hundred grand servicing aquariums. And I know for a fact he is because I've seen, I've seen him make money. And uh, so it can be quite profitable to have a six figure income and all you're doing is cleaning fish tanks is pretty significant. So you just have to do the research, do the work. Uh, he said that uh, make your local fish store your best friend. So definitely, as I shared earlier, if you are going to have a service business, connect with your local fish store and always look for new clientele because that's something that, you know, it's always going to be a revolving door. People get out of the hobby, they move, whatever it might be. So that's why I recommend like having those cards with you to, you know, hand out to people. I used to take my business card to the local fish store and let them hand them out. So I knew that they didn't have, they didn't have a, uh, a service set up or they were too busy. And so they would just hand out my card or my email, my phone number, and I got a lot of clients that way. And then some jobs are hard. So there's some horror stories that I have myself, uh, some horror stories that he's told me. Sometimes it just is terrible, um, but that's with any job, right? He was telling me about this job that he did at an art, uh, an art exhibit. So in, in San Francisco, they had like an art gallery and this artist made something and they wanted it inside of a fish tank. So they had like this tall cylinder fish tank and it was a nightmare. He ended up going back to like five times. It was leaking all over the place. The artist was not a fish person, so they were super angry with him. So um, it's just how it goes, but it is quite profitable if you want it to be. All right, moving on, content creation. You guys know YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you know, whatever, Discord servers, podcasts, blog articles. There's lots of different ways of creating content, uh, whether it's for entertainment or for education. It's not as profitable as people think. So you might see a YouTube channel, they've got 100,000 subscribers, they're getting views every week, and you think they're raking in the money? Not at all. So just to give you some, some quick analytics, a video that gets 1,000 views, you're getting about four to $5. That's not that much. So for who here has a YouTube channel? All right, there's a few of you. Who, so you guys know, like you don't make a ton of money when it comes to, to, inco to uh, views. So if you wanna make money making videos, you're gonna need to have some decent views. So 200,000 views per month, long form videos. So that's not a short, because that's a whole different revenue stream. If you're gonna like go horizontal and make a video and talk for more than a minute, if you get 200,000 views, you're gonna make about a thousand bucks, right? in that month, roughly. It's just gonna depend on the click-through rates and the algorithm, all that, all that kind of stuff. But roughly about a thousand bucks to get 200,000 views. That's not easy. There are many months when I don't get 200,000 views in a month. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but it's very difficult to get that. So um, just know that if uh, you're doing it, do it for the passion, do it for, you know, you wanna educate people, you wanna enjoy it, but not because you're trying to get rich because you could go and clean four fish tanks and make the same amount of money that you would make in a month making YouTube videos or more. So um, just know that because people always think, yeah, I'm going to make a YouTube channel. I'm going to be rich. Like not so much. Uh, if you are going to have if you are going to have a channel, you want to be knowledgeable. You want to be passionate about it. Um, that's going to come through better uh, when it comes to um, what you're talking about. Uh, and then figure out what platform suits you best, right? If you're really good at writing, 
Maybe think about writing blog articles and advertising on there. If you're really good in front of the camera, if you're charismatic or you know whatever, funny, maybe be on um, videos. If you're really good at photography and you don't wanna be on camera, maybe you focus on photography and Instagram or stuff like that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can um, monetize content creation. Just know that it's not as easy as people think. So real quickly, how to get started. Don't have gas. If you don't know what gas is, it's not what you think. It's gear acquisition syndrome. It's like multi-tank syndrome for aquariums, but it's with camera gear. Don't get it because you don't need it. Use what you have. Use your cell phone, iPhone, Samsung, whatever it is. I started my channel with an iPhone 6S, and I think I got my first 10,000 subscribers before I bought a camera. It was all on a phone. And I even edited my videos on a phone. It, was, it wasn't even like using a computer. Uh, you wanna make consistent content. Make content every week. Uh, be consistent with it if you are gonna do it. Try it for a few months. If it works out, keep doing it. If you do it for four, five, six months, you're like, this, this sucks, I'm not doing anything. I've made $14, I'm gonna do something else. So just, just uh, give it a try before you buy anything. Don't, don't waste money on cameras and lenses. And I was telling uh, Jimmy that uh, I have this gimbal that I bought that I've used twice. I bought this drone, I've used it since like, I will crash one in, in a lake or a river. Uh, this one I bought, I've used it like once or twice since I bought it. So just use your phone, you don't need a bunch of stuff. Um, if you are gonna be online, you gotta have thick skin. People are gonna say things about you that you don't like. They're gonna say things about the way you speak, the way you look, your, your lack of knowledge. They're gonna argue with you. Have thick skin. It doesn't matter, just kinda move on. Listen to your audience. If you are gonna make content, they're gonna tell you what they wanna see. They're gonna tell you by their views. So your analytics are gonna tell you what to make and the comments as well. So listen to your audience and build your brand. This is very important as we segue into uh, kind of here getting towards the end here for anyone that's uh, time checking me. So brand ambassador sponsorship, build it and they will come. That's the field of dreams kind of thing there. But basically you wanna build your brand, right? You might be wondering why there's a picture of a motorcycle on here. That's me. That's me many, many years ago when I was younger and, and skinnier because you gotta be small to fit on a bike and go fast. And I wasn't the fastest, I was good. I would get on the podium every now and then at like regional races. And if there was a, a race with like 60 bikes, I'd be like fifth, I'd finish fifth. So I wasn't like winning and you know, at the top all the time, but I was really good at marketing myself. I was really good at building my brand. So I was able to get sponsors that people that were way better than me that were on the pro circuit couldn't get because of the way that I was going about it. So. Same thing with aquariums. You wanna build your brand. If you are gonna be a content creator, you want to uh, um, basically be marketable, right? So if you're gonna make a YouTube channel or something that you want people to pay you or, or sponsor you, then you wanna be marketable. You wanna be professional. You wanna be all audience friendly, right? So there's kids that watch YouTube videos. You don't wanna be cussing and swearing or doing anything inappropriate because you're gonna lose the whole market. Uh, work with brands that you believe in. So don't just take money from any, anybody. All money is not good money. There are some companies that I'll say, no, thank you. And there are some companies that I will say, absolutely, I would be happy to work with you. You can see a list of people I've worked with here. Um, and then don't be afraid to say, no, thank you, as I shared. So if you don't believe in their product or if there's some, if there's some reason that you don't wanna you know, accept their $150 to wear their product or show their product, don't do it. Be genuine with the brands that you work with uh, and be genuine to your audience that this is something that I believe in, this is something that I'm using. You wanna be very transparent. If you, if you do have something that's free, tell your audience. If you are paid by somebody, tell your audience. So I have paid sponsorship, I get free stuff and I usually always, I always tell people if I'm talking about the product, I got it for free or um, I was being paid. And lastly here, as we're running out of time, there are a lot of different jobs in the aquarium industry beyond what I just talked about. So look around here, there's tons of vendors, whether you're a store, 
if you want to build a store, if you want to work in a store, obviously those are some opportunities. Uh, science, conservation, education. There's lots of different areas there, obviously working in universities, laboratories, um, specialty online businesses. Some of you have online businesses that I know of. Uh, art, right? There's people that are making fish art, apparel, t-shirts, paintings, whatever it is, there's ways of, of uh, monetizing that and making money. So that was the very fast 30 minute version of my talk, but uh, any questions before I go? Yes. Where's Corey? Corey is not here. He's back in the uh, Seattle area and um, he's actually getting ready to go to China on Wednesday. I can't hear you. Yes, go in there for business. Any questions on my very fast presentation? They, they give you guys any ideas on making money? All right. What's that? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, anyway, I'll be here all day. So if you want to ask me later, I'll be wandering around. If you want to ask any questions about a, a certain topic or if you have another idea, I'd be happy to share it with you. So thank you guys.